Okay, so I just need to name these substituents. There's one here. There's one here. This is methyl, right? This is chloro. Um, this is part of the parent. A lot of people want to make that a substituent for some reason. I understand. but And this is the double bond, so this is uh, butene. So it's 2-butene. And so then this is one, sorry, ethoxy. I should have done this one earlier. And all it is, it's the name of like the ethyl substituent with the YL hacked off and put oxy at the end. And that just tells people that's an ethyl group connected by an oxygen. Okay. All right. So how do you put it together? Alphabetically, right? So this is going to be uh, chloro before ethyl before methyl, right? So it's going to be three chloro, yeah, one ethoxy, um, two methyl. And then what's the last thing? Uh, what's that? Parent chain, 2-butene. So I'm just drawing an arrow like this. I know it's messy. And now what's the last, last thing? The stereochemistry. And then you just have to assign priority numbers. So if you look at the double bond like a uh, line like that, this is one on this side and this is one on that side. And so it's E or Z? E? E? Z? E. E. Yeah, sorry. E. So then all you have to do is say E. And this goes in the very front. Okay. Now, if you had two double bonds, if you had a double bond in a chiral center, you have to say which number it is. But if you only have one stereo center, leave the number off. People putting the molecule together will figure it out. Okay, so let's do uh, R1-methoxycyclohexene3-all. Oh yes. Okay, so let's let's uh I'm gonna clear the slide here and just break the name down first. It's cyclo hex N Right? So what does that mean? It's not cyclohex N, it's cyclohex N, so it's got a double bond on it, okay? And it has a 3-all, which means it has an alcohol functional group. And it's got a 1-methoxy, and it's in the R configuration. So let's try this. Something's weird about this name, actually. I'm trying to figure it out in my head. Yeah, exactly. I think that's supposed to be an A-N. <coughs> this is an A-N. Because alcohol has higher priority. That's why I said there's something weird in the name. That makes sense, George? All right. George has seen a lot of this. So he's a smart young man. I'm going to use you as my reference. So I've got to draw a cyclohexane. Um, and then R1-methoxy. There's definitely something weird in this name. I know, it is. We're just going to go with it. They're telling us to draw this, so we're just going to draw it. I know. Methoxy would look like that. And then 3-all. Three 3-all three would be this. And then I'll go check it out. Um, I only really wanted to do this because of the handling of the R. Like it was a double bond and the one was the alkene, then it wouldn't be R, right? Or this would be the R part down here. So there's something really weird. I think what they're implying is it's this. Okay. That's why it says EN. 
and the, it's uh, anyways. How do you handle this R and S? Right. It needs to be pointing out to the front or the back, right? So a lot of times um, what I do first before I draw the bond, let me just do this. I'll put an OH out here. And I assign priorities. So this is one. This is two. Uh, this is three. And then four is an alcohol, is an OH, uh, is, sorry, it's a hydrogen next to the alcohol. Now, the configuration the way it is right now, it goes like this from the it goes like in that direction, right? So, that's in the R direction. So, you want the H to be in the back and the OH to be in the front. And so then that, that's when I draw in like this. I just leave them off. I let them float in space and I determine the priorities before I draw the bonds. Okay? But yeah, there's definitely something wrong in that name because it should have been one all, right? And two cyclohexane. All right. We'll make an exercise in naming it later. Um, just a little bit again on properties. Um, ethers have a similar bond angle to water. Uh, it's a little bit wider. The hybridization is still considered to be sp3. Um, it's wider because the R groups on the oxygen take up space and push the bonds apart, okay? Um, in terms of intermolecular forces, um, you know, alcohols have very high boiling points. Water has a really high boiling point relative to its molecular weight simply because they can hydrogen bond, right? And then ethers can be hydrogen bonded too and are polar, but can't hydrogen bond themselves. They don't have the hydrogen on them. So, um, yeah, the maximum number of hydrogen bonds an alcohol can have is one. Okay. Ethers can't have any, but they can be hydrogen bonded too. So in that respect, then what you expect is, as far as boiling points go, all right, alkanes are gonna have the lowest boiling points. Alcohols would be the highest. And then ethers are in the middle. And in terms of intermolecular force, this is van der Waals or induced dipole. This is dipole. And alcohols have H bonding. Yeah, dispersion, yeah. So I'll put that there. Because different people teach it as different things. Okay, so that's dispersion. So if you look at just trends, right, look at the top one, that makes perfectly good sense. Um, ethanol, boiling point is 78, dimethyl ether is 25, and then Propane, and all these have similar molecular weights, right? It's the lowest boiling point because it lacks any real strong intermolecular force. On the other hand, if you look at a series of ethers, there's dimethyl ether, diethyl ether, and dipropyl ether, and the boiling points go up substantially as they get longer, right? And that's the effect of the induced dipole acting like Velcro. Remember I talk about Velcro in my other classes that I talk about this kind of stuff? You get two strips of Velcro, right? Even though this, the Velcro bands themselves, the little hook and the cloth are very weak, right? When you get two long strips of Velcro and you put them together, then it's a, it's a very strong force because of all the interactions going side to side and all the little hooks going along. That's why you could wear that Velcro suit at that, what's it? Bounstein House Place, you know what I'm talking about? Jump It Up, I think it's just called. You get, they let you wear like a Velcro suit and you can spring into a wall and then you're stuck on the wall. <laughs> I'm not sure why that's fun, but it looks fun to me. I'd rather levitate, but you know, if I'm given my choices, levitation's probably out for me, I'm just saying. Okay. 
Uh, we like to use ethers as solvents because they have some polarity to stabilize charge transition states. And a lot of the reactions we do have charge transition states, like um, SN1 has partial charge, has charges, carbocations. SN2 has partial charges, E1, E2. All these things have charges. Grignard reactions have charges in them because of the Grignard reagent itself. So it's a great reason to use ethers as solvent. The other thing is they're relatively unreactive unless you're in really acidic conditions. And we'll talk about how ethers decompose uh, in reactions. And they're not protic. Okay? And so this is important for Grignard reactions and SN1, S, SN1 rea SN2 reactions, sorry, that have an aprotic solvent. And the, like the favorite reason is that top one, actually, why people use it. When you're done with the reaction, it, they boil at su such low temperatures, they're very easy just to evaporate off. Okay. We're actually using it in lab today. Sorry, I posted a note that led everybody astray that there was no lab today. Yeah. I said no new lab today, but that's what I meant to say. The pre-lab notes were from... I gave last week, but anyways, you can hate me for it later, that's fine. Okay, I want to pass over this, talked about this already. Ah, so, the other really cool uh, compound, uh, which I should have used the other computer for because I simulated them, are crown ethers. Uh, crown ethers are neat because uh, they literally look like a crown. The oxygens are often pointed towards the inside, uh, especially when there's a cation present. So one of the problems with using like uh, fluoride ion as a nucleophile is it's so highly charged, it's very hard to get it to dissolve into an organic solvent. So what somebody figured out a while ago um, is that crown ethers can behave as what's essentially known as like a, a phase transfer material, where you could take a very charged material and pull it into an organic solvent. The way it works, actually, it's kind of shown in this picture, this is a... 18-6 crown ether, or 18 crown 6. There's 18 atoms, 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And this is the electrostatic potential map. It's the charge distribution on the crown ether. Because the oxygens are negatively charged, they, you can see a lot of red charge here. These ones, um, you can't see it on here, but because of the tetrahedral nature of the oxygens, those ones are actually pointing down. So it's like the ones that are bright red, right, they're pointing up like this, and the ones that are light red are pointing down like this. But on the other side, if you were to look at it, it's bright red here, here, and here. And this is a potassium ion. So when you make a potassium ion, the crown ether, the potassium ion fits right in the center of the pocket, which is, you know, it's cool. So why is that uh, useful? Because you can take, like, potassium fluoride and put it in with a crown ether, and it'll grab the potassium ion and pull it away from the fluoride. And because the fluoride's no longer bound to the potassium in the organic solvent, it's a great nucleophile. Okay. The other thing is um, it also helps because you have the positive charge pocketed in all this sort of nonpolar stuff. It also makes it much more soluble in organic solvents. Okay. Um, if you guys are familiar with uh, related topics, anyways, if you guys are familiar with ion channels, like this is the idea of making artificial ion channels because you can make a hole just the right size for an ion to go through and, and stabilize the ion as it passes through, for example, a cell membrane or something. Of course, they're too short for that, but that's the idea of using these things. Uh, oh, so back up. Oh, it doesn't say on here. Okay, so crown six, uh, it, it turns out fits potassium perfectly. Um, crown five fits sodium, and crown four fits lithium. So you can have all these different crown ethers and pocket different ions inside of them. There's a chart here somewhere. No? Okay. Oh, yeah, here it is. That's what I was looking for. Hang on. So back up. So you take KF, uh, potassium fluoride, uh, crown six ether, in benzene, and this is what you form. This is the, the potassium ion trapped by the crown ether that frees the fluoride ion. 
And then you can do cool things like this. You can use fluoride as a nucleophile in this reaction. Okay. If you remember um, this little statement that's up here, one of the reasons uh, why fluoride isn't used as a nucleophile, we talked about this a long time ago, is its small size attracts the solvent. And it's like, you know, the really high char highly charged solvent or uh, nucleophile walks into a room and all the solvent is attracted to him. You remember that analogy? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and so they all surround him and he wants to do his SN2 reaction. And, sorry, this is for you guys and you guys. <laughs> right? He wants to go, to, he's at a party. So let me start with you. Fluoride comes to a party, right? And he's very highly charged and attractive because of his charge. And he walks in, and what's the first thing that happens? All the solvent molecules bond to him. But he wants to perform a particular reaction, so there's a particular substrate at the party that he's interested <laughs> in. But he can't get to the substrate because all the solvent molecules won't leave him alone. So the idea is, is that that's when we brought up this idea of aprotic right, polar solvents. Anyway, that's gets a little bit too intimate at that point, so we won't talk about it. But, um, but that's the reason why this is a, a neat idea, is because you can use fluoride as a nucleophile. And it's not affected by solvent as much because of the crown ether effect. Okay? And you can do it in nonpolar solvent, sorry. OK. So let's talk a little bit about making ethers. Um, Probably, um, okay, so let me, let me uh, start off like this. There's, there's two kinds of ethers that, that people want to make. They want to make um, symmetric ethers or asymmetric ethers. A symmetric ether would be like diethyl ether, okay? And in diethyl ether, what you have is you have the same alkyl functional group on either side of the oxygen. And so for making symmetric ethers, uh, a very simple way to do it is to use an acid-catalyzed reaction in which you protonate uh, the OH of one of the alcohol molecules, and another one comes in and does an SN2 attack, and then you deprotonate, and then you have your diethyl ether. Uh, this is facilitated by the idea that diethyl ether has a very low boiling point, so as soon as it forms, it boils out a solution, so you can isolate it away from the reaction mixture so it doesn't decompose in the process, okay? So kind of like a Le Chatelier's principle, this is all equilibrium stuff over here, right? But if this has a lower boiling point and you can remove it from the solution, then naturally the equilibrium will keep shifting to this side. So this is a common way for making ethers. Okay, go ahead. And symmetric ethers. I guess he does this only work for ethanol because it doesn't some alcohol with strong acid will produce a yeah, that's true. Um, but I don't think it'll matter. I'll go over the mechanism with you. There's a lot of different ways that the ether can get formed, even with the strong acid. Okay. Do you have to use ethanol? If you want to make a symmetric ether. Well, yeah, then it'll be diethyl ether. But if you use methanol, it'll be dimethyl ether. Yeah. All right, propanol, by Anyways, but some of them will eliminate faster. Right, but primary alcohols typically will go by substitution faster. Okay, so uh, the other way is to use what's called Williamson ether synthesis. It really, this is for asymmetric ethers, or they say asymmetrical ethers, but I could never bring myself to say that. <clears throat> okay, so for making asymmetric ethers, you use a strong base to deprotonate the alcohol, and then the Williamson ether synthesis is to use this alkoxide ion as a nucleophile for an alkyl halide. Right. And when you do that, then you form this ether link. So you could take any alcohol, or many different alcohols, I should say, um, and many different alkyl halides and produce ethers from them. But these would be asymmetric, so you would have a different left side from the right side probably more common than using sodium hydride is just to use sodium ion. Um, I think I talked about that a little bit before. 
if you take an alcohol like this and you take a sodium atom, you can do that. That produces So that's the sodium hydride. And then you can do this. At least that's just one way to remember it. And the alkoxide ion, this will then further react with another alcohol to form another alkoxide ion. So these are your nucleophiles for the reaction, and then you can bring in an alkyl halide and form an ether. Okay. So Let's say this is MTBE. That's the stuff that they used to put in gas. Do they still put it in gas? And they stopped putting it in gas because it's leaking into all our groundwater uh, as an oxygen source for gasoline. Uh, there's two different ways that you could produce this from uh, a Williamson ether synthesis. And sort of to imagine the two different ways is, is by looking at what they've shown us here. You could take a tertiary alcohol. What is this going to do to it, NaH? Hydride, it would be a hydride transfer, essentially, but to form the alkoxide ion, all right? So you would get, this is after one, like that. And then step two, take CH3I. do that. And what they're showing you is that synthesis works. But the other way to do it, if you recognize it, you could make the alkoxide ion from this. So after one, you get CH3O minus. And then you would add it to the T-butyl iodide. But they're showing you that that doesn't work. Why doesn't that work? Yeah, steric hindrance, right? It's an SN2 reaction. So the nucleophile does a backside attack, but in this instance, this is too sterically hindered. It might, but it probably won't. They should have put a poor leaving group on it, I suppose. Alkyl halide is too sterically hindered. And because the alkyl halide's uh, too sterically hindered, it won't do an SN2 attack. And then the second thing, that's important to recognize about this. Tertiary alkyl halide, strong base. All right, so you get an elimination reaction. So there's too much steric hindrance for a nucleophilic attack, and then tertiary alkyl halides are tertiary and secondary eliminate so quickly that it's hard to make an ether that way. Okay. So, so principally, sort of the moral of the story kind of is on this, uh, on this kind of synthesis. The alkyl halide has to be methyl or primary for it to be like a high yield synthesis. And so when you when you design a synthesis, if it tells you to do Williamson ether synthesis, right, then what you have to do is you have to make sure your alkyl halide, if you have a choice, is the least sterically hindered and that your alcohol is the nucleophile. Okay. 
Yeah, so the other problem with this, this reaction is strong base plus tertiary alkyl halide equals elimination. And so you'll end up with isobutene instead, okay? I hope so. Yes. Okay, so let's look at this. Uh, how would you go about using Williamson's uh, ether synthesis to make that? Okay, so again, your choices are you have an alkyl halide and an alcohol that you're using, and you can break the bond either here or here. It doesn't really matter. So the oxygen can go to the right or the oxygen can go to the left. So which side gives you, which side would be the alkyl halide? The left. Like this. Because that's the least sterically hindered alkyl halide, okay? That's the one the nucleophile has to attack. So that means your alcohol is going to be this. It also has a stereochemistry to it, so we'll fit that in there. So, alkyl halide, yeah. If you did it the other way, just to show it, you would have uh, this and because you want an inversion, I have to do it like that. All right. But this is a more sterically hindered al alkyl halide. So it's less sterically hindered than that. Principally, again, you want it to be primary or methyl. That's where it'll work the best. So then the process would be uh, like this. Sodium or NaH, doesn't matter, but just use something different. And then two is to add the uh, alkyl halide. And that'll give you that top product. So the other way to make ethers, um, particularly secondary or tertiary ethers, is to use uh, the oxymercuration demercuration reaction. But if you remember, uh, just real quickly, I'll just write it on the board. When the book brought this up, this was chapter 9, I think. One of the things that the book talked about is, let's say you have that, and you wanted to make a secondary, in that chapter, chapter 9, there was a secondary alcohol. So you would take uh, HGAC2N... Um, water, and then the second thing was uh, sodium borohydride. Uh, what you end up with in that case is this, uh, and you, you'll need to look at the mechanism again, because it, it, it we'll see it a couple of times as we go along. One of the things I pointed out when we did that is, this is just a nucleophile that displaces the mercury from the intermediate. The intermediate looks like this. Let's 
see, close, close, I think it's the pause. And then so a nucleophile can come in and attack at this point. So the nucleophile can be this, or it can be on an R group. And so when the nucleophile attacks, it attacks here, and then that bond breaks, and that forms the next intermediate, which is going to be O, R, H plus, and H, G, and then A, C. I guess that it's actually O, A, C, is what they use in that book. See, I said A, G. It's connected to, to show that it's connected to the oxygen. And then the last step is the removal of this by the sodium borohydride and also the deprotonation of the oxygen. So that's what the alkox, they, so they call that, instead of calling the oxymercuration demercuration, they call it um, alkoxymercuration to say that you're using an alkyl group or an alcohol instead of water, okay? So there's HGOHC. If you do this, you always end up with the alcohol on the more substituted carbon. So it follows uh, Markovnikov's rule for addition. Okay. When the nucleophile attacks the uh, more substituted carbon, and for the alkoxy mercuration demercuration reaction, all you do is you change the water into an alcohol. And then the alcohol adds to this more substituted position. So exact same reaction, exact same mechanism, but the solvent is an alcohol instead of water. Okay. But using this method, you can make tertiary alcohols, you can make secondary alcohols. Um, and one of the other uh, advantages is there's no carbocation form, so there's no rearrangement during this whole process. Okay? So you can form a secondary alcohol next to a tertiary carbon. Um, yeah, so let me, uh, I made space on this slide to redraw the entire mechanism. Uh, your book does a couple of, does a couple of things different than I do. Uh, you could do it either way. I'll show you the way, uh, so to speak, that I learned it. Like this, and then uh, it's one of those concerted reactions that does this. And then one of these groups leaves. So that ends up giving you mercury in the middle. And there's an OAC up here and a positive charge like that. And then the solvent comes in. attacks the more substituted carbon, and it attacks that more substituted carbon because the transition state has a positive charge in it because the mercury has a positive charge in it, and the positive charge is more comfortable at the more substituted carbon. So there's, this is a competing like rates of reaction. This reaction is competing for this reaction attacking here, but because this is more substituted and the transition state looks a little carbocation-like, it ends up going faster through the more substitute position. That's the lower energy side. Then the bond to the mercury breaks. You get something that looks like this. And then what happens? You guys remember? Then a miracle occurs. 
Uh, yeah, we don't know the mechanism. So <laughs> we just write something happens. Uh, you can speculate a lot. Like there's a lot of things that show up in the products. But I decided I'm not going to waste time on all those things. Oh, and then minus H plus as well. That's not part of the miracle. That's just deprotonation. And then two hydrogens show up. I mean, you can imagine, you've seen the borohydride reaction now several times. You can imagine the first step is that the hydrogen transfer here and the mercury just breaks off, right? But then in the process, there's like elemental mercury that's formed. So there's some things in the mechanism that are just like, wow, well, it just happened. So there's a lot of different things going on. But it's a hydride transfer probably that does it. Um, in terms of reactions, right, the mercury is added from one side. The alcohol comes has to come in from the other side of the cyclic mercurium ion, and so this is an anti-style reaction. Okay, so this is that ether we made before. It says ethers are generally unreactive. How do you make ethers reactive? And I'll give you a hint. It's related to how you make alcohols reactive. Protonation, right? So ethers are generally stable to about pH 1 or 2. And once you go below about pH 1 or 2, the hydronium ion concentration is high enough that it begins to protonate the oxygen enough that the, 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 uh, the molecules, ethers, will begin to break down. So generally speaking, H the conditions are acidic, usually less than about one or two pH units, and then heat. So if you were imagining what would happen here, you would protonate here to form that, and that's a good leaving group now. So the bond could break. In this case, which side do you think it'll break on? should break on the right-hand side, right? So it can break on this side, like this. Now, typically there's something that drives this, and one of the ways, common ways for splitting up ethers or breaking up ethers is to use something like HCl or HBr. If you had used HBr with this, right, this hydrogen would be this one over here, so I had Br minus. This will be a nucleophile. It'll tack on either that side or it can attack on this side, right? Which side is it most likely to attack on? Yeah, on the, actually, it prefers to attack on the left side because it's the least substituted side, less sterically hindered side. Ultimately, though, when you do this reaction, the products that you end up with <laughs> would be something like this. Because if you take an alcohol, because the product of this is an alcohol. So if you take an alcohol and you react it with HBr, that's one of the ways that we make alkyl halides. Okay. So typically, HBr, HCl, HI... Uh, the first part is the cleaving of the ether bond, one side or the other, and the second part is actually just converting it over to an alkyl halide. Okay, so mechanism looks something like this. All right, this is a simple version. Uh, dimethyl ether. Right? Uh, they used to call these mineral acids. I don't think we call them that anymore, but like HBr, HI, HCl. Uh, protonates the oxygen, and then the halogen that's left over, the halide ion, attacks nucleophilically uh, to one side or the other, and then produces this alkyl halide. Okay, so that's from the first nucleophilic attack. But because you formed an alcohol, okay, here, alcohols are subject to con conversion to alkyl halides as well. So this, 
it's not like you stop the reaction halfway through and it's done, right? It just keeps going. And so eventually what you end up with is you protonate the alcohol, then the alky the alkyl uh, the halide attacks to form the next alkyl halide. Again, water being a good leaving group. Um, this is maybe the uh, exception to that. Okay. Yeah, so the R group will definitely pop off. So if you think, like, in terms of mechanism, you get this. And then at this step, right, the nucleophile comes in and attacks. So my X, well, not my X, I don't have an X, but the X, the halide, can attack either the R or it can attack over here. Turns out this doesn't happen. You guys remember? <coughs> right. Vinyl? groups are not subject to, like, nucleophilic substitution. The reason, um, well, two things. The pi electrons block the nucleophile. In other words, think of, oh, shoot. I accidentally touched something on the screen. Yeah, there we go. This molecule's flat. In order for there to be an SN2 reaction, it has to come from the back side, right? But this is a ring. So the back side would mean that the nucleophile would have to come from the inside of the ring to displace the leaving group. So it turns out this was like the exception of, you know, both of them being converted into an alkyl halide. What you'll get in this case is that because you can't do a backside attack on that and remove the oxygen and the alcohol is on the other side. Okay. Oh, because the ring, in order to form the alkyl halide, Right, it's a substitution reaction of the OH functional group when it's protonated. When, when, if you protonate this and try to kick the oxygen off, right, it's an SN2 style reaction. It has to come from the back side, all right, and you can't do that. The other thing is you can't form a vinyl carbocations we talked about before. Vinyl carbocations are very unstable. That's the positive charge on the sp2 carbon. Oh, I think my computer just died. Um, <coughs> Yep, computer just died, but it knows it died, so I'll stop it here. <laughs>